But I let you I won't be overwhelmed Give me vision To see things like you do But I let you You wear my heart grow strong Give me wisdom For you know just what to do
Welcome to Calvary Chapel in Lynn. Saints. Every time I use that word saint, I always think of Jay Lynn in the view. He was one of the first uh, preachers that I used to listen to when I got saved. And he'd always use that phrase. Either you're a saint or you ain't. <laughs> so if you have a bulletin, grab your bulletin out and... We're going to go through in a second. If you don't have one, I believe we have one left, so you might have to share with your neighbor there. It's always good to hear that the bulletins all were handed out and we, don't have, we didn't have enough. So that's good. If you don't have one, it's probably because you were late. And it's because you ain't. 
All right. A few announcements, not a, not a whole lot, but a few. So our men's retreat meeting will be in July the 1st. So the guys that are now a part of that meeting and setting up, pray for them. As the Lord is leading us to find a place, uh, the venue, the theme, and so forth, all of those things. Um, it looks like we are settled on October the 4th through the 6th. The 4th through the 6th, so you might want to start praying about joining us. There's only enough room for about 16 to 20 guys. Uh, if you're interested, you can start paying now. The cost, it looks like, will be right around 125 but don't, don't quote me yet because we still have to figure out the cost for the food and so forth. So um, hopefully you can join us. It's going to be a really great time. The theme is going to be around the Holy Spirit and being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life and to determine whether truly we are born again or not born again. Uh, so it's going to be an off-the-hook men's retreat in October. So put that on your calendar. We're going to have a 4th of July party here at the church. Now, this party is for those that, that don't have family, that don't go to the big spectacular fireworks show. This is for the families that don't have anywhere to go. You know, want to have some fellowship. And so we're going to be here at the church. doesn't mean you all have to meet here. We're just offering it to just have fellowship and just have a good time awesome. with the barbecue and, and food and drinks and so forth here. There's not a spectacular fireworks show around here that I know of. But the Lord's here, and we're here for those that are lonely and don't have family and don't have opportunities to Amen. do those things. So uh, if you are a family that gets to do all those things, maybe you'd like to invite someone that doesn't. That's always a good thing, too, and, and bless them. Um, it's always good to bless someone. It feels good to bless someone. Amen. It really does. We went to a men's conference yesterday, and the guys were waiting in line to purchase their, their tickets that didn't purchase them online or in advance. And they're just waiting in line. And we had uh, three extra tickets, and I was holding on to them because I invited the guys from the church to come on out if anyone all of a sudden had an opportunity to come out, and no one did. So I just went up to the couple of guys that were in line, and I said, here, here, here. And they're like, what's this? It's a ticket to get in. The Lord wants to bless you. They're like, wow, that was awesome. So they didn't have to buy a ticket, right? And they got in uh, without purchasing tickets. So it was nice to be able to bless them. It just, it just feels good. I don't know why that is. Is that just me, or, or do you guys feel the same way when, when you help someone, right? It just makes you feel better. So, so come on out uh, here at the church. We just ask that you bring uh, a, a dish of some sort, you know, a side dish and a drink, and we'll just, you know, a fellowship together. Let, let's make a theme. We're just going to do it now through the Holy Spirit. Let's make it uh, a barbecue, hamburgers, and chicken kind of theme. So that's the theme. And you can come on out on the 4th of July here at the church starting at 4 p.m. And fellowship. Baptism meeting will be June 23rd after the service here. We have so far about 10 people getting baptized. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it, I'm getting excited. <laughs> So if you have not been baptized and, and desire to get baptized, please see me afterwards so I can get you your full name and get you into this meeting here. We'll talk about baptism. That baptism will be on July 7th. It will be at my home. We have a pool. We have volleyball. We have jacuzzi. We have a shaded area. And so I think you'll have a great time of fellowship if you're not getting baptized. Just to witness and be a part of the fellowship is always nice. And it's a great opportunity to reach out to your families and neighbors and invite them to the event. Uh, so if you are getting baptized, make sure you invite all your family to the event and they get to see it. And they get introduced into the church and they see that we're not a bunch of crazies, right? <laughs> right. You know, we're just normal people trying to live for Jesus as best Amen. we can in a, in a crazy world. And, and so they get to see us firsthand, how we have fun, how we can, we can actually swim, and we play volleyball and those kind of things. So they won't think that we're just... You know, Jesus freaks that go to church every day. So that will be July 7th. And there will be a little flyer in the back if you uh, do not know where we live. And it has the address and a couple of instructions on there. All right, let's have the ushers come forward. Today the youth have been serving us. It is Youth Sunday. And they set everything up. Uh, you probably noticed they ushered. They're in the back of the sound. And 
They've done pretty much everything. So they have been a blessing, and it's our way of, of uh, teaching them how to be servants. And from that group, the Lord will pick and choose those that will be in ministry and serve Him in great and mighty ways if they're open to it. So we want to give them a hand. Let's do that right now. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come before you now as we desire, Lord, to bless you because you've blessed us so much, Lord. And so we give to you, Lord, a 10% of our wages, Father, of those usable income that you have blessed us with, Lord, that you may continue to bless us and use us and increase our, <clears throat> our income and resources, Lord, so that we can even give more, Lord, for the furtherance of your gospel, that we can reach out to this community as we Feed people out in the courtyard who are waiting to get groceries, Lord. Over 100 people come out every Sunday, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that you'll bless them, encourage them, yes. and let them see through your spirit, Lord, the love of Jesus Christ here, Lord. And truly, Lord, the light yes. is here, Father. And yes. we desire just that men would know Jesus and fall in love with him. And we pray, Lord, for your message this morning, yes. that you would open up our eyes to understand let your spirit fall upon us, Lord, and give us understanding. That we would pay attention, that we would hear with no distractions, Father. But totally hear the voice of God today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> Good morning again. Good morning out there in the courtyard. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. This morning we will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we will be looking at verses 1 through 8. And the theme of this morning's... Okay, that's, did I write the wrong thing? It's actually Christian disputes. Christian disputes. Not glorifying sin, that was last week. <laughs> this morning is Christian disputes. Um... Before I get into it, it's a tough subject, right? Because how many of us have ever dealt with another brother in the Lord and had a dispute? Let's raise our hands. We've yeah. all dealt with that. Every single one of us have dealt with a dispute with someone else. Whether it's in our family, whether it's a relative of some sort, a distant relative, whether it's a neighbor. Ooh, I can tell you stories there. Whether it's a neighbor or whether it's a Christian in the church. And I can tell you lots of stories there. We've all dealt with disputes with brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And I think we'll all agree, it's not easy. It's difficult. It's hard. In fact, some of us probably still have some bitterness in our hearts. And are struggling with it from time to time. Especially when you see the other party, right? It's really hard. And I know I'm right there with you. A hundred percent. I totally get it. And so this message is for us as we go through the Bible. I don't pick and choose the theme. God does. Yes. And this is the next section because we finished chapter 5. We're now in chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. So I have to deal with, with these scriptures myself too. And they always minister to me too. In fact... Before uh, I got up here, um, Jesse was singing that song about Jesus Christ on the cross you know, and what he did for us. And I just broke down. I just broke down because it's a part of my message at the end there. And it just, it really hit me. It hit me hard. And I just began to weep tears from my eyes because I realized how much I failed him. How much he has done for us. And how much of a great example he is when he went to the cross. When everyone was against him. And he had every right. Every right to defend himself. Amen. But yet he didn't defend himself. And we'll talk about that at the end. So we're going to talk about Christian disputes. You know, flipping a coin. Drawing straws. You ever draw straws? <laughs> right? And I always lost Taking a number out of a hat has been used to resolve disputes for centuries. I read of an election in Oklahoma where two leaders, mm -hmm. candidates, received 140 votes apiece. And rather go through the expense of an election recount and so forth, the city officials decided to let's just play a game of chance and see what happens and let that determine the winner. 
And they were all for it. And they agreed to it. And flipping of the coin or drawing of the straw, there's your winner right there. I guess what the writer of Proverbs said was true when he said it in Proverbs 18, 18, casting lots causes contentions to cease. To cease. In other words, when you cast lots and you agree, whatever it is, heads or tails, you win. Tails, I win. Whatever it is, fine. Our contention is over. We'll let the coin decide. And yet it keeps the mighty apart. It keeps the mighty apart. From the Christian's perspective, there is so much things that are left to chance or not left to chance. God is either directly or indirectly involved in everything that happens to us. We all agree to that because he's God. He knows beginning to end. And he's involved in our lives actively, whether we know it or not. In fact, there are times when we hear his voice and we refuse to listen and to act upon it. You ever been in a situation where you're going to make a decision or go in a certain direction and something just says, don't do it? That's God's voice keeping you from trouble. And then you do it and you wonder, oh, why did I do that? I should have heard that little voice in my head. And there are those times when God is always ministering to us. So, so he is actively involved in our lives. And we must trust and obey him in any circumstance because even in the smallest details, he is in control. He is in control. Now, what does this have to do with settling Christian disputes and flipping of a coin? Well, when we understand that God is in control, even in the flipping of a coin, he knows the winner before you even flip it. Right? Well, then we can trust God to know every side of the story. He will know your side of your dispute and he will know the other side's dispute. And in the end, when we stand before him, he will judge rightly, right? Amen. It will all come out in the end. Because I think, I believe there are times when I am literally, I can't say the word. Uh, what, what was it? <laughs> that word's not in my vocabulary. Something like that, right? It's wrong. I'm sure I'm wrong. Somewhere down, it, it's rare. It's rare, but I'm sure that I have been wrong at times. At times. But you know what? Even if I'm right, even if I'm right, it doesn't mean that I have to be right. And I'll get to that. Let's look at chapter 6 as it deals with the subject of the Christian and the relationship that they have between the state court system. Yeah, the state courts. They had courts back then, the Roman court. That's where Jesus was tried under the Roman court. They also had the Jewish courts there. And how we have a relationship today with the courts of our system. Having taught that the church uh, acts as a court in, with regards of sexual offenses in chapter 5, right? Paul says, we don't judge the outside, we judge the inside. This man is sleeping with his father's wife and the church needs to do something about it in a sense that's a court and you're making a decision that this is wrong and we need to kick him out and so Paul dealing with that now he argues for the necessity of the church courts in the society that we live in so in a sense and I know that you probably have never experienced this I have in the system of Calvary Chapel as a non-denominational if you have experienced uh, a denominational uh, situation, then you probably experience that when there's disputes, you take them to those in higher authority, and those in higher authority settle those disputes. That's how the church is to function, and that's what Paul is dealing with here. So let me break these two sections here up for you. Verses 1 through 6, we have Christian lawsuits that were being presented to the Corinthians there, and then... The wisdom, the wisdom of accepting uh, the wrongdoing in verses 1 through 8. There's wisdom in that, though it's very difficult to receive. And we'll see that. So three points this morning. Going before the court. Second point, Christian judge. And third point, accept wrong. Accept wrong. So let's read the text so we get the context here. Verses 1 through 8. Paul says, dare any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unrighteous. 
and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? And then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life. Do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes against, or brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now, therefore, it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, and this is why, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do things to your brethren. What a text, right? Yes. I'd like to read that over again just so that it just fills our minds and gets to our hearts. Because right now, I'm feeling like, Lord, I've wronged people. I've been wronged. And maybe I ought to just let it go, Lord, and move on from there. But we will see that God does not want lawsuits in unbelieving courts. But that a wise man in church should settle the matters between the brothers. Jesus even talked about this in Matthew chapter 18. We'll notice that we will be judging the world and the angels during the millennium reign here. So let's look at our first point, going before the courts. This was the problem. Dare any of you, Paul said, having a matter against a brother, and it could be any matter. Normally it was some sort of financial matter. It was property. It was usually civil uh, between the parties. Go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints. So Paul saw reason for writing back in verse 9 here as we saw last week he said in verse 9 i wrote to you in my letter not to associate with immoral people not to associate with anyone so-called a brother if he is an immoral person and in verse 12 he said do you not judge those who are within the church and then he said in verse 13 remove the wicked man from yourselves remove him now he talks about our disputes with others and how the Proper settlement should be. And so he says, and let me give you my amplified Greek. He says, does any one of you Christians or Corinthians, when he has a case or a matter that's important against his Christian neighbor, so apparently the Corinthians were using the secular court system to settle their disputes. This was literally happening at that time. They went to their neighbor and they began to argue and said, I'm taking you to court. Well, I'm taking you to court. And they would go to the secular courts there in Rome or Greece, wherever they were at. In fact, it continue, it, it says this, actually you dare continually to go to law. So this was actually taking place. And it was happening all the time. It was a part of them dealing with their relationships with one another. Continually before the unrighteous courts and not before the saints in the church. That's what they were not doing. The word dare there, is, dare there says in the Greek to be bold or deal boldly. So they did this without even thinking about it. They were bold about it. They really felt it was the right thing to do as they were bold in doing it. They might have even bragged about it to their friends. You know, yeah, I'm taking so-and-so to court and we'll see who's right or wrong here. Kind of That kind of boldness, right? You know, like when we're in a situation and we know we're right, then we get a little bold. But I'm right. And you're wrong. And there's a boldness there. And we're going to prove that you're wrong and that I'm right. There's an arrogance there. There's a selfishness there. The word law here means judge to preside over with the power of giving judicial decisions. So it was literally a courthouse where there sat a judge on a bench and he decided the case and they were bringing their cases to those courts. The local judges sat in that 
what they called the Bema Seat of the Civil Magistrate, which was located in the heart of the marketplaces. These places were literally outside in the marketplace. If you've ever gone to Israel and you go to Abraham's uh, gate, uh, there is a gate, and this was usually where the entrance to the city was, and usually where the market community dwelt, where they would sell their vegetables and items and things like this. The judges would sit by the gate. They'd have a little throne area, and the judges would all sit there. And if you had a matter <coughs> that needed to be resolved, you'd go there to the gate and to the judges. So it was done out in the open, which is interesting, because then you had an audience, right, uh, to watch. And it became entertainment. So that became their reality show to go to court <laughs> and to see the Christians try to settle their disputes in a sense. Right? And that's sad because now your laundry is an open, you know, for everyone to see uh, as you're disputing among, among one another. And it's sad because then the world says, what's the difference between you and I? Amen. What's the difference? And, and that's Paul's point is what is the difference between us and the world when we're in disputes and the difference should be that we're able to settle our disputes calmly courageously with meekness and with resolve and love for one another and that should be the, the, the difference that they're drawn to to Jesus Christ so Paul's using a, a term here of unrighteousness in a religious sense not in a moral sense it isn't that Chris, uh, Corinthian judges were necessarily bad judges at all, but they were not Christians. That's his point. They weren't Christians. They don't know the Bible. They don't know God. They don't know what we believe and what we put our faith in. And lawsuits exposed the church to the judgments of unbelievers and what they thought and what they believed. And we're leaving them, we're leaving ourselves in their hands, which shouldn't be the case. How can an unbelieving court recommend the proper spiritual principles for our lives? It can't. It can't. And yet that's what the church was doing. They were going to secular courts to settle their differences. So second point, Christian judges. We need Christian judges. We, we need men and women that are able to resolve situations, to be mediators in a sense between parties. And we have that in the church. You have your brothers and sisters here. And when there's a situation, you can go to someone else. If you can't resolve it yourself, then you go to someone else that might help you resolve it. And hopefully it will be an uh, equitable agreement. Look at verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, Corinthians, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So he continues with the truth that we are more than capable of making honest judgments here. He says, or do you, in my Greek, or do you not know it's a fact. This is a fact that the saints will judge the world. That's a fact. He, he states that as a matter of fact, that one day, at the end, the millennium age, we will literally be judging the world. We're going to sit with God upon his throne with the, with the 12th, tribes who will be doing their judging, but somehow we will be participating in judging the world during the millennium age. That's going to be an interesting thing to do. Now, Christians should be fully able to judge their own matters because of the destiny and the knowledge of the Bible. They should be able to come to a conclusion in their disputes. And as we reign with Jesus, we will in some sense, be judging this world. And Christians are being prepared right now for such a glorious destiny. Why do the Corinthian Christians allow those least esteemed here that he says by the church, that is the secular judge, they're least esteemed because they don't have the wisdom that we do. And yet they're deciding the disputes between Christians. Do you know that the weakest of a Christian is wiser than the smartest of the secular world. Amen. Now you might say that doesn't make any sense because he probably knows about the molecular systems and how it works. That's not what I'm talking about. He can sit there and tell me how it all works, but does he know where it came from? And the weakest of Christian will go, God created that. Yes. Besides, Amen. are you an idiot? Amen. You don't know what you're talking about. God created that. No, you don't know what you're talking about. You understand how it all functions and works because God has seen you, the, has given you the evidence, the empirical evidence, because you're seeing it working, which is proof that it's working, but you don't know where origin came from. 
But that weak Christian goes, yeah, that's God. But you don't see it because your eyes are blinded to that truth. But the weakest of Christians can say, that's God. So he's a lot smarter than that guy. He might not know all the particulars, but he knows where it came from. God himself. If the world is judged continually by you, the church, are you continually not competent or unfit to constitute the smallest law court? So just like today... In Paul's times, the upper class received better treatment in the courts. Kind of, we see that today, right? I mean, if you have the money, you take someone to court, you probably will win. Because you have the money, the best lawyers, right? We saw that in a very famous case years ago, just because of a glove that did not fit. You know, If it don't fit, you got to acquit. You know, those are lawyers that know how to speak and know how to get to people's heart. They study the psyche of man. You know, and you get the money, you're going to win. And that's what happened. And we see it all the time. Now, if you're the lower class of society, uh, they really couldn't sue the upper class because there were different classes. And so there were some prejudices there that Paul is trying to bypass by saying, no, when you are in the church, there is no prejudice because God's not a respecter of men. Whether you're wealthy or you're poor, we're to treat one another equally because we're equal in the eyes of God. But for Paul, even the lowest believers are equipped to judge cases. Why? Because they have the wisdom of God. Now he goes on in verse 3. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So yes, one day we ourselves will be judging angels. And again, he's stating this in the Greek. It's a continual action that will actually take place in the future, at the end, that we, the saints, will be judging angels. And then he says, how much more the matters of this life then? If we're going to sit in the end judging angels and judging the world, then why can't we judge today the matters of life? And Paul is using a series of do you not know here. And when Paul says do you not know, you can be sure that the brethren did not know, did not know. This is a polite way of Paul, for Paul to say that we were ignorant of these things. And I think there's a lot of people that are ignorant of Christian things because they're just not reading their Bible. They're not reading their Bible. Um, I get questions periodically from people, especially Christians, or they call themselves Christians. And, and when they have this question, it's not that I, I, I don't look at them as, as though they're ignorant. I look at them as they miss the opportunity to understand these things because they're not reading their Bible. And if they just read their Bible, they would have the answers to these things. And some of the questions are very simple questions. And I answer them because I want them to know the truth with, and I give them scripture to back it up. But it's interesting because it tells me that they're not reading their Bible. Now, I'm not trying to keep you away from it, coming and asking me questions so that I don't think that way of you. <laughs> but seek first God. Read his word. You'll be amazed at what's in there and how much you will learn in time. I know that for a fact. When I got saved, before I was saved, I was, I was stupid. I was. My dad said, don't ever say that. You didn't know stupid. There's no one stupid, right? Just uninformed. And I believe that. But that's what I thought of myself. I went to, to school and got D minuses in all my classes. Never turned in homework in my life. I don't know how I even got a D minus. Never picked up a book to read on my own. I got straight A's in PE. Love that. That was my best class. In fact, it was so light that I would go in the morning to PE and run cross country, and then I'd go in the afternoon to PE and then during the class, and I'd go after school to PE to run more cross country. That's how much I loved it, but forget the other subjects. So I never read anything in my life. And then I get this job at Southern California Edison by God's grace. So I've got to take a test, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I took a little bit of college, so I had some basics, you know. And I remember going through the interview, and the guy said, so how do you, how do you convert <clears throat> um, DC voltage to AC? And I'm like, wow, that's a good question. How do you do that? And I'm like, well, uh, you see. And the guy looks at me and says, think of your car. 
I'm like, yeah, okay, your car, you know, your car has a battery, it's DC. Yeah, how does it convert it to AC? So I'm like, yeah. So well, you have an alternator. The alternator is convert. That's how you convert it. You use the alternator, converts it over. And he was giving me the answers. You know, and then I walked away like, I'm not getting that job. <laughs> and I met this Christian man who gave me my first Bible. And he went over there to talk to them. And he came back and I asked him, how did I do? He goes, you're in. I'm like, I'm in? <laughs> how did you do that? That's God's grace. That's God's grace. And I remember going to some of the first meetings when I worked for Edison and wouldn't say anything, sit in the back, quiet, didn't open my mouth. Because when I did, people would laugh. You're stupid. You don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. They'd be talking about the electronics and the um, mathematics, algebra, you know, um, calculus. And I'm like, man, I don't remember all that stuff. I can't remember that. And then I got saved. And I picked up this book right here. Just like it, a smaller black. And I started reading it from Genesis to Revelation, and I read the whole thing in six months. And then I read it again. Then I read it again. My first Bible, because it was so interesting to me, I literally had yellow. I yellowed every verse in the Bible. Because everyone every one of them seemed to speak to me and was so important. I, I mean the whole thing was just yellow. And I remember having it at the beach one time and, and, and I was reading it, I put it on top of the igloo and the waves crashed on the shore and went too far up. I'm short, and there went my Bible, and the eagle is floating around. I'm running after it, and it fell into the water, you know, and so now it's all wrinkled in. The yellow is now the whole page because it got soaked. I still have it. That was my first Bible. And I remember after 10 years, 15 years or so, I went to a meeting, and they were asking if there were any questions. I raised my hand, and I asked a question, and I asked another question, and then we were debating back and forth and so forth. And then I walked outside after the meeting, and guys were coming to me and going, Ruben, where did you learn how to speak? I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, you, that's not you. <laughs> You've never done that before. See, God gave me an education. It came through his word. Amen. And all of a sudden, I understand words. I knew words. And I know I still have struggled with it a little bit, but you should have heard me before. <laughs> All of a sudden, I was educated by the scriptures. And then it wasn't just scriptures, because then I got a hunger for commentaries and reading other books and stories and bibliographies and things like this, and now my education grew. So I know that if we were just to study, if we were just to read, we would grow in our faith tremendously. Mm -hmm. So Paul is saying here, the least of us should be able to handle these matters in life. Verse 4, if then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church judges? And again, it's those that are least esteemed. Those that, that are not esteemed in the world, these judges don't really know what they're doing, and why would you appoint them over you? But I say... This to your shame, verse 5, is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren? This is the sixth question here of the eight that he is asking. And this question is in verse 5 and 6 here. He says, I, I say this continually in the Greek to your shame. And, and what he's saying here is that I'm trying to shame you. I'm trying to bring shame to you because you're not able to find someone to judge between matters among you. But you would rather hold a grudge and not deal with it. So Paul's hope was to move them to proper doctrine, to understand there's more to the situation than just ourselves and what we want or what we think is right. But there's a, a witness that is there that brings glory to God. So he says, but brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Third point, <clears throat> accept the wrong. And this is the point that I think that we really need to concentrate on. That's what was happening. There was disputes. And Paul is saying, you have a church, and this church is supposed to function this way. You have a pastor, you have leadership. You have elders, you have people within the church that are seasoned Christians that have been around for a while, they've gone through disputes of their own that can give you wisdom, and you ought to utilize that wisdom. 
And that's what he's saying in the second point there. But we don't do that. That's so difficult for us to do with our disputes. We would rather make up our own mind and just depart. They call it when you begin to detach yourself. You know what happens with detachment? What happens when you, when you have a situation in the church and you can't figure out how to work it out, you begin to detach yourself. So you start looking at the church and going, look at that. Why are they doing that? That's so wrong. Look at how they're dressing. That's not right. I mean, what kind of church is this, really? The detaching part happens. You start judging things so that you can feel good about leaving. Yeah, I don't belong there. It's not a good church. I'm gone. And you leave. But the real issue is not any of that. The issue is that you can't deal with that dispute, that disagreement. It's called detachment. We do it in our marriages. We do it with our children. We do it with friends. Automatically detachment. We find the bad things in people's life. Now, I'll tell you what. You can find a bad thing in anyone's life <laughs> because we're all bad people. The Bible says yeah. we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Yes. Every one of us. So you'll find bad things. So that's not the issue. You look hard enough, you'll find a bad thing. Now the issue is you're not willing to surrender and submit to God mm -hmm. and what his word says. This is God speaking to us right now. This happens in the church. As I said earlier, we all have dealt with disputes. He set up the church so that we can handle those disputes. And then you have to surrender yourself because when you invite someone in to help you, and then that person looks at it fairly and then says, I think this way is the right way, then you should be able to say, then I'll accept that. I'll do that. Even though you might not feel it, <laughs> but you leave it in God's hands. And that's the third point, accept the wrong. Look at what it says in verse 7. Now, therefore... It is rare, already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? Oh, that's so hard to accept the wrong or to be cheated because we don't want that to happen to us. I don't want to be wronged. I don't want to be cheated. That's not right. Isn't there things that we should do that are right? We, we're supposed to live right. So why can't we just do right and say what's right and argue what's right, you know? <laughs> so Paul concludes with a profound suggestion here, and I really believe it's a commandment for us. It's a commandment. Let me give you my amplified Greek. Actually, Corinthians, then it is continually already a defeat for you. And it truly is. As soon as you begin to puff that chest out that I am right and I'm not going to be wrong, you've lost. You've lost. They haven't lost. But you've lost. And you continue to lose because you've lost that relationship. You've lost in that situation. And chances are you probably will never speak to that person again. Be a part of that group again. I have many, many people in relationships here from the church that have left in those matters. I had a person here that, <clears throat> I'll give you an example of this, that just loved us to death in the beginning. And we helped them out to get their chaplainship, uh, gave recommendations and the whole thing. And by two years later, they were detaching themselves. Oh, I don't like this person, I don't like that person. And one day, they're like, Pastor, I don't like the way you teach. And boom, they, now they were able to leave and feeling good about it because the church was all bad. And we haven't seen that person since. No communication. They, they utterly blocked us out from Facebook, utterly disassociated with us and everything because we're that bad. Mm. You know? That's what happens. You continually, you continually fail in that situation. And this person was very intelligent, which makes it even more of a surprise, a counselor of people. Strange. But it happens, and we all deal with it. Now, again, we all have been in these situations, and some of us might be right where Paul is talking here. See, the Corinthians were just like Americans, addicted to what was their right, right? This is my right. I'm not a doormat. Who do you think you are? I have rights here in America, and we'll fight for those rights. We cling to those rights fiercely because there are rights. We are free, and we can do what we want. And Paul is saying, you've already shown utter failure. 
Just by going to court against your brother, you've already lost, Paul said. It says that you have continually, because that's what they did, continually went to lawsuits over one another. And then he said, why not rather? Now, interesting word, not rather. That's actually one word in the Greek, and it means to prefer. Why wouldn't you prefer or be more readily or sooner more willingly? Why isn't, in other words, why isn't your heart more apt to immediately say, I'll take the wrong? Why is it so quickly, I'm going to get you? Right? Because there's a flaw in our hearts. Selfishness. So he says, why not rather actually, because be wronged. And that's a matter of reality, he's saying there. Why not actually be wronged? Why not rather actually continually be defrauded? Now, the continual action in the Greek, the, the, the present tense, is suggesting that you're wrong, and if that's the case, and God knows it, it's a continual wrong, and God will handle it in the end. That will be his judgment call at the end. Many philosophers who believe that property did not matter because it advocated an ignorant offense rather than going to court. In other words, during the Greek culture, they thought, what's the big deal? You lost property. Go buy another shovel. Don't waste time trying to get your shovel back and creating problems because that was material. Material didn't matter. So we see this happening more and more today where criminals are let go from prison and they pursue um, or not pursued because of the crime system. Uh, being too, too uh, petty in some cases, or is too crowded, and and so we're seeing these, these law officers, these judges, these, these politicians saying, you know, we have a lot of criminals, we need to get rid of them from prisons, costing a lot of money. So there are a lot of criminals that have done petty things, like stolen things. So let's just let them out. Hopefully, they won't steal again. Uh, so you see that philosophy is there. So it's not a big deal. So why can't we just let it go? They stole the car. I get it. You already have another car. They, they served a little bit of time. Just let them go and get back into society. Hopefully they won't steal another car. In fact, there's a push today that if we love our prisoners so much that they'll realize that they shouldn't harm society. And there's a push there uh, in this love esteem kind of thing, self-love type of attitude. And so you're seeing prisoners let go that are murderers, that are druggies, that are, you know, committed those kind of crimes and felonies and so forth because if we can get them to feel love, then hopefully they will love back. And that's what Paul is saying here. That's what's happening with the Corinthians. So he's taking that philosophy and he's kind of turning it around, right? And he's saying, look, why can't you do that? Why can't you just receive the wrong? Why can't you say, okay, I'll take this one for you? you know, instead of making a big deal out of it. Now here's the kicker. Look at verse 8. This is why. Paul says, no, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to your brother. And that's why. Because we're all guilty. I used to tell my kids uh, when I would punish them, I tried to punish them correctly and make a good judgment, right? Sometimes I'm wrong, though. I got the wrong guy. The other guy got away with it. And so when I punished them, I said, now, I'm not sure if you're the one or not. I'm not. I, don't, I promise. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know if you are or not. But I am sure you've done something that I don't know of. So you can consider this punishment for that. <laughs> and I would tell them that. I said, so if I'm wrong, I'm sorry. But I'm sure you've done something I know you didn't get caught at. So here's the punishment, you know. <laughs> because we've all done something wrong. You know, it, it's funny because even in our church, I'll get someone say, so-and-so is doing this. And then down the road, I'll hear someone else tell me how they did that. Not they, but the person that had told me earlier. And I'm like, wow, they were just telling me about so-and-so, but they've done it too. <laughs> you know? See, the issue is that we start pointing fingers and we forget there's three pointing right back at us. How many times have I cheated someone? <laughs> How many times have I cheated someone? How many times have I done wrong to someone? You know, we've all done that. Now, in this case, what Paul is saying is the reason 
that you won't take the wrong is because you're a cheater and you're going to get what's right. It's all about arrogance and selfishness. It's our selfishness. See, Paul gets right to the real issue of the matter of the heart. On the contrary, the reality is you yourselves continually wrong. That's the Greek. That's the reality. You guys are really the ones that are wrong. That's why you won't take the wrong. Usually it's the one that's humble that will take the wrong. Am I right? The one that says, that's okay, I'll take this one. Because that's humility. And the one that defends himself is probably the one that's always wronging people. That's pride. And he's saying this is really happening. And you continually wrong people. It's a matter of practice on their part. And also continually defraud. That's the way they live. They're constantly defrauding and wronging and growing and getting richer and richer. And they see that it works and they're going to continue on. And when they're defrauded and wrong, I'm going to sue them. So I can get even more. And they give it to their brothers, which makes it sad. Now you might disagree with Paul, what Paul's saying here about being wrong, but remember that Jesus said the same thing about the issue. Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek to him, he said. Then he said, if anyone wants to sue you and take any of your clothes, your tunics, then have them take your cloak also, he said. He even told the people that if the Romans ask you to walk a mile with their stuff, which was the law, they could ask you, hey, I want you to carry my stuff for one mile. He says, go two miles. You see what he's saying? Mm -hmm. Be willing to take the wrong and then go even further. That's some humility and some wisdom here. See, if it is wrong for a Christian to claim their rights if it will hurt others. You have the right to surrender your rights and let yourselves be cheated. We have that right. And we can choose to do that. But we don't. You should be less concerned with your rights and more concerned with your responsibility and with your reconciliation of a brother than anything else. Is my relationship with my brother worth more than what they cheated me out of? Am I willing to just forget that? Now let me close with this. And this is profound, I believe, because the greatest example of this, let's listen to this, the greatest example of this is Jesus Christ. Yeah. He stood before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate said, I find nothing wrong with this man. And the Jews accused him. They screamed out, crucify him. They mocked him. They spit on him. They ridiculed him. The Bible says he went like a lamb to the slaughter. Did he say a word? No. Was he wrong? Yes. Was he right? Definitely. Did he deserve it? No. <clears throat> and my sins were the sins that he carried. My wrongs. My defrauds. My accusations. He took them all. And he never said, Reuben, you wronged me. No, he just took it. He said, I love you. Remember when he was on the cross? And he's looking down at everyone. And he's talking to the Father. And he, at that moment, he said, Father, look at them all. Hypocrites. They put me up here, Father. It was all their sins, all their wrongs, all their cheating attitudes towards one another. Father, judge them. He didn't say that. He had every right to say it. He would have been right in the court of law. He could have brought all the evidence out. Stand before me now and tell me if I'm wrong. Right before the judge. And there's nothing you could do. But no, he said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. Now there's a thought and a principle that I have carried on. It doesn't always stick with me, but I try to remember it. That when someone harms, harms me, when someone talks ill of me, that I remember and I go, Father, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. I forgive them. And it helps me to forgive them because I plead ignorance on their case. 
that they really don't know what they're doing. And I think it's true to a certain degree when someone begins to scream and yell at you hysterically, and it's not Christian at all. It's totally secular and humanistic. And they're out of their mind that you would say they don't know what they're doing because they don't. They don't. Because it would be like screaming and yelling at Jesus. Can you imagine Jesus on the cross and you come up to him? What's wrong with you? How dare you, Jesus, cheat me out of what's mine and allow these people to get away with it? Because that's what we're doing. <clears throat> when we begin to accuse others, when we ourselves are just as guilty. You know, the Bible says that what you do to your brother, you also do to Jesus. So, if you want your sins to be forgiven, Jesus said, be forgiving. Be forgiven. <sighs> this is profound. I sat there, as I said earlier, and as Jesse was singing that song, I thought, Lord, I've been wrong so much. And yet you hung on that cross, not saying one word. God, forgive me. I want to be like you, but it, and yet it doesn't seem enough to know that truth that Jesus didn't say a word. I need your Holy Spirit. I need your power. I need you to come into my heart, Lord, and change me from the inside out so I can be more like you and not concerned about being right. You know, a husband can be right and then let the wife know, I'm right. But guys, we need to realize you don't need to let her know that. Just say, yes, honey. You're right, honey. I love you. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And that's what Jesus would do. Let's bow our heads. Ask the guys to come forward. I, I hope the Holy Spirit has spoken to you about this issue. I know it's not one that we deal with all the time. Uh, you definitely would not hear a message like this from a church that just teaches on topics. Yeah. Yeah. A church like that teaches topics on giving money because you want more money. You know, no, this is a church that teaches through the word and deals with topics that we will probably deal with punctually, but once in a while. This will happen once in a while in your life. There will be some easy ones that are quick, easy fix. You know, oh, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. Let's communicate a little bit more. We forgive one another. Let's give a kiss, hug. You know, we become better friends. There are going to be some of these issues that are going to be big in your mind. And it's your own family. And it tears you apart. And somehow you've got to find a way of being like Jesus. Gracious Father. Lord, we, we need you. I mean, it's evident today, Lord, that we can't yes, measure yes, up Lord. to your truth, Lord. This is evident that we can't, we just can't measure up, Lord. And so we need you more, Lord, in our lives. Forgive us of our sins, Father, of our wrongs, of our hurts and defrauding of others, Lord. Forgive us, Father. Help us to see our hearts, our own heart, that we may be more like you, Jesus. And Father, if there's anyone here that doesn't get this, Lord. I pray you open up their eyes. Yes, Lord. That they would receive Jesus into their hearts yes. and surrender their lives to him, that he may give them understanding. And it's simple, Lord. All they need to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. I'm a sinner. I'm falling short of your glory. And I need you right now. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and save me from myself and from this world. Thank you, Jesus. Give me eternal life. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name we pray these things, Father, and trust in you. Amen. 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 Let's stand. Amen, everyone. So, um, please, you for. As we mentioned earlier, today's Youth Sunday. Um, my name is Carlos. I'm the youth servant slash leader. Um, so we are, we're thankful that all you showed up today and, and were able to spend time together.